Okay, I'm starting with a quote and I'm not sure where I got it at one of the many Zooms or webinars or whatever I've been to recently. It says, I think that no matter how old or infirm I may become, I will always plant a large garden in the spring. Who can resist the feelings of hope and joy that one gets from participating in nature's rebirth? That fits me to a T and it is so nice to be in the company of so many other eager gardeners today, missing out on some sports, I understand. Hmm. We can dream of someday having a garden like Becky's. Many of us live in Iowa's Less Hills. Sioux City used to look like this. This is just south of Sioux City. Iowa was 85% prairie. We chose this time to go with an Iowa grower and include more prairie plants that are native to, to here. Many of the prairie plants being offered require, require good drainage. John Judson of Diversity Farms is our grower this year. He's on the left there. This is um, part of his um, plantings that he harvests from and he harvests from other prairies. He has done many, many gardens throughout Iowa. This one was a rooftop garden in Des Moines and it was featured in the Iowa Prairie Conference last summer as a field trip. So it's a green roof. And he has done many large plantings of prairie from seed like this one. And this is Mark Wetmore's Flather Wetmore Pioneer Memorial Prairie. And that's the last time I think I'll read all of that whole long name. It'll be Wetmore's and um, Flather's Wetmore Prairie, okay? This is what it used to look like. But in February of 2016, John came with his seed and his spreader and sowed the seed and we got a beautiful prairie and we got wildlife back. This is a photo from our summer field trip to the prairie and I'm going to zoom in. We were literally immersed in a sea of, they usually say grass, but I'll say a sea of prairie. Isn't that just totally awesome? John's wife, Kay Newman, has been to Sioux City several times and to the Les Hills Prairie Seminars. She's a raptor rehabilitator. She releases raptors for, for lots of events. This is John's greenhouse. And these are the peat pots. We're going to use less plastic this year. This is kind of an experiment. But he has experience with growing plants in the peat pots. And these are ours. They're not yet in the peat pots. By going with John, we are able to add 11 species that we were not able to get from our former supplier. We are in this Great Plains region of the eco region and the supplier was in the green region that's to the east and did not have those plants. These plants, these are the um, nectar plants that bumblebees need. And I'm sure some of you listened to Heather Holm this past week and I co copied the slide and um, we are offering a Monarda, two Penstemons, two Echinacea, two Solidago, two Symphiotrichum, which is asters, a Laetris, two Baptisia, a Dahlia, and a Morpha. A Morpha is lead plant. So we're good. <laughs> these are pollen plants, the Baptisia, the Dahlia, and the Symphiotrichum. So great. There were so many considerations 
I mean, I have been going every which way for weeks, looking up information and um, finding pictures that aren't copyrighted, et cetera. I mean, you consider sun six hours a day versus part sun or shade, bloom time, bloom color, what layer? Ground cover, which are really highly recommended now, the blooming middle or structure plants, drought resistant, deer or rabbit resistant, available moisture, sprinkler system or downspout, native to our less hills, native to Iowa, nectar versus pollen plants, native and specialist bee needs, bumblebees needs, host plants for butterflies and other insects, etc. And then keystone species. I looked a lot of those up, so I'm going to provide that information on the slides. So John and Mark provided their own slides. Otherwise, um, most of them that aren't otherwise noted are from me, and I've noted the ones from the Lost Hills Wild Ones members, and Prairie Legacy and the Prairie Flower provided some. A whole bunch came from Candace Wildflowers and Minnesota Wildflowers Info. And artistic photos were provided via Iowa Native Plant Society from the late Linda Scarth and her husband, Robert Scarth. And also some field trip photos from Iowa Native Plant Society. So instead of going with one slide for each species this year, I have created several so that you can see the plants in different locations, in gardens, out in a prairie or whatever. So you will get to, um, and it allowed me to provide a lot more information also. So finally, introducing the native plants offered by Les Hills Wild Ones in the spring 2022 sale, plants grown by Diversity Farms. First one is lead plant. And I think I'll leave the slide on for a moment and let people look through it and then we then I'll make comments if that sounds okay. I think that really says it all. Um, it is really important as a, a diversity of structure plant in a garden. And it's very well behaved. And I love those orange stamens sticking out, just beautiful with the, with the purple. Pollen-laden bee on the plant. the silvery leaves. And then wild columbine. Everybody loves wild columbine. It's gorgeous. Danielle provided this photo. Wouldn't you love to go out into your garden and take such a beautiful photo of such a beautiful plant? So delicate and so important to early pollinators. And the leaves are beautiful. Here it's happily growing in a shady area. Here happily growing in the sun. And here, happily growing in a rocky cliff and always gorgeous. Rose milkweed. We all know how important the milkweeds are. in a native prairie. This is in a garden. These photos are from Kansas. 
and butterfly milkweed. Everyone knows of the beauty of butterfly milkweed. Everyone wants butterfly milkweed. So I hope you already have it, or if you don't, get order it now or get some more. That's in a native prairie. This I took at night. It brings a host of butterflies to your yard, but not deer. A tough perennial that bursts forth with clusters of orange flowers in summer. Heat and drought resistant. Depend on it to look good, even with little care. This is a planting that John did in Des Moines. No, Ames. This one was in Ames. This was taken at night. It has my butterfly milkweed and menzelia, which I'm trying and trying to get to grow again. It's, it's really a Western plant, but I love it. As you can see, it's gorgeous. And then uh, some black-eyed Susan in the picture too. That's out front. You can see some um, spotted bee balm and other flowers and grasses there. And of course, we always welcome the caterpillars. And our white Baptisia is just, I've, I've had it now for several years because I got seed from, um, King Cemetery in Crawford County from Glen Pollock. And um, that cemetery has lots and lots of it. And finally, you know, I sowed the seed and finally they've come up and they're gorgeous. It has a long bloom time because it It'll have one branch bloom and then the other branches will, will um, proceed to bloom later on. So it extends the bloom time. You can see those branches in this artistic photo. Those will bloom later. And that's overlooking my compass plant and wild blue indigo. And it's kind of hard to see this with all the green, but um, there are some of the lower branches are blooming now and the upper part has seeds already setting on. This is what it looks like to the north of my house. This is in a prairie. I mean, it's really a standout. And this shows the, the flowers, the leaves, and the seed, seed pods. And um, the seed pods are used sometimes in bouquets, in winter bouquets. And this is our wild blue indigo. This was at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center, Young Plant. In the Kansas Prairie, in my rock garden, in the pods. This was out front of my house, it has the, the wild indigo pods on the left and the New, New England aster and snow on the mountain and native grasses. The ripened pods.
purple poppy mallow. It's one of my favorites too. Note that it's an excellent ground cover. And mine never get eaten by the deer or rabbit, so I don't know. But I read that it was minimally deer and rabbit resistant. Definitely drought tolerant. That's why it makes a good ground cover. It's nice low leaves. This was at the Garden of Discovery at the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center. We've also seen it in um, cemeteries and in parks because it grows so low, it can survive mowing. Palm sedge. This is a new one that we have not offered before. And I had trouble finding pictures of it. So it is a unique sedge. Prairie Coreopsis. Note that the, it says it can spread by rhizomes, but less so in well-drained, poorer soil. So if you put it into a, a really rich, fertile garden soil, it could be um, aggressive, but not so if you have your garden well-planned and have, have it well-drained and, and poorer soil where you put it. And it's, it's special because it blooms earlier than the other yellow flowers. And deer and rabbit resistant too. This is at Dorothy Pico Nature Center Garden. This is out on my prairie with lead plant right by it. And you notice the leaf is very distinct. These are photos from Kansas. And the purple prairie clover. What's not to love about this one? <laughs> I once wrote a poem about this and I, Sorry, I didn't look it up. It was referring to it as a pink tutu, if you know what I mean, <laughs> because it, the, the blooms just go up and, um, and it just reminded me of that. And these are just lovely pictures of it. It typically grows in clumps, does well in a sunny home garden in average to dry soil. The great pollinator plant. And notice the leaves, the vegetation is so nice. So even when it's done blooming, it's still a nice plant. We're offering two species of purple cone flowers. You can't grow wrong with them. Go, you can't grow wrong with them or go wrong with them. Decide which is right for your garden or different areas in your yard. The blooms can last for weeks. They attract so many butterflies and pollinators. They look lovely when planted by other flowers. They're great as a cut flower 
Their rough foliage helps to make them deer and rabbit resistant. So this is the one that we find in our prairies here in the Les Hills. This is called narrow-leaved coneflower. This is in my prairie. And Lisa McNeil shared this photo with us, showing a regal fritillary on narrow-leaved coneflower in her remnant prairie. And this is at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center. And these photos are from Kansas. So narrow-leaved coneflower versus the pale purple coneflower. And I'll just let you read those. So this is pale purple coneflower photos. The prairie flowers Bev Redder provided this photo. Isn't it amazing? But see, they're growing, you know, to harvest the seed. And so here's a big, big patch of it. This is flowering spurge. These are photos from my from out front of my house. I oftentimes use photos of this in my um, Christmas photo collage that I create every year. The flowers can be kind of sparse at the top or they can be a full panicle. This is how mine usually grow. Wild geranium. Now this is another one that can be used as a ground cover. Prefers light shade to partial sunlight, but tolerates full sun if there's enough moisture. It's one of the easiest woodland plants to grow. Here's those leaves making a good ground cover. Prairie smoke. You may notice that many of our, uh, well, like six of the, the plants that we're offering this time are called prairie something or other. Well, this is another prairie something. This is prairie smoke. And it can also be planted as a ground cover. It likes full sun, but it's okay in part sun. And it's deer resistant. And the red is distinct and the, the, uh, it, the color lasts for a long time. So it adds a lot to a garden. Sneezeweed. Now this one prefers wetter soil. This 
what I meant about this, sneezeweed can be quite successful in a garden and a few plants will go a long way. It seems like when you plant sneezeweed, you do get a lot of blooms and um, you can control the spread by the type of garden that you put it into. So you can just pay attention to that. This is at the Dorothy Pico Nature Center. There's another one that starts with prairie, prairie alum root. And I've got that growing here too, that I planted. And it can also be used as a ground cover. Close up photos. In my wild rock garden, I'm not very tidy as you can see. Northern blue flag iris. This is another one that likes it moister or wetter. Dotted blazing star or blood, dotted gay feather. This is in a native prairie. This is in my prairie planting. This is in my rock garden. Cardinal flower. This also goes into my Christmas collages. <laughs> That's what you get to see if you go out in it in the um, early evening. Hummingbirds really do like red. Now, Iowa Native Plant Society has a card featuring this. And also I included this um, on our Christmas card this year that we sent out from Los Angeles Wildlands. Great blue lobelia. This was from the prairie flower. This is at Flathers Wetmore Prairie. These were probably taken in the wild. From Prairie Legacy. And this is in the garden at the flower house. You see it on the left there. Spotted bee balm.
very unique flowers, very unique. The leaves have the scent of Greek oregano. Rabbits and deer do not like the scent and usually leave them alone. Drought resistant, but watering can prolong the bloom period. Missouri evening primrose, stunningly big flowers for such a small plant. Note that it does, it prefers full sun and dry conditions, rocky or sandy soil or poor soil, but it's okay in more fertile soil if it is well drained, but it can get out competed. One of my mind um, when it when it was a brand new a planting of it, and here the rest of the garden is filled in and it's still there. You can see it in the front there. It's a very popular garden plant, even though it isn't native here, and. It, that it supports 12 butterflies and moths. That's probably since other, other evening primroses do here, it probably they would use this one too. Showy penstemon or showy beard's tongue. This is a, a new one that we've never offered before. Very interesting flowers. It's only found way down in the southern Lus Hills in Iowa. And it's rare there. More pictures of it. You can see why they'd be attractive to hummingbirds. And then large beards, beard tongue. This is the one that's native around here in our prairies. It says minimally deer resistant, but I have had no trouble with any deer ever eating any of them. I and I've got plenty of deer, so I don't know. Last year, I counted 80 along my lane. And there's a sphinx moth in this photo. You can barely, it's all, it was moving so fast, it's just a blur. It's along my lane with porcupine grass and skeleton weed. Then prairie, here's another one, prairie phlox. See, it needs long-tongued native bees. Because you can see how narrow that tube is, the flower. This is a photo that Mark took at Flathers Wetmore Prairie. This was at the Garden of Discovery.
in a prairie. This is a native prairie, it's called Steel Prairie. Taken on a field trip. A garden grown group. Mine is first or second year. I only planted a few. This is Bev Rutter's photo from the prairie flower. And this is the Kansas one. Black Eyed Susan. It's excellent for first year plantings of wildflower gardens, excellent. It's beautiful in the prairie in the summer and also in fruit in the winter. Danielle provided these two photos, this one and the next. This is a Dorothy Pico. Another garden photo and an artistic photo. Wild Petunia. It's one of mine. You can see the floral tube is long. That's why, again, it's another plant that hummingbirds like. The seeds burst when ripe, and uh, the stems and leaves are hairy. It's not native here, but it is found in Sioux County, north of us. Close to half of Iowa have counties have it, so I feel good about it having it here too. If your garden is really um, fertile or you know good loamy soils, it can be aggressive. But it's so small, it probably wouldn't out compete other stuff. I don't know. And it's great at the edge of the garden. Little blue stem. It's a bunch grass. Interesting the bumblebee queens can overwinter at the base. Offers nice color to a garden in the in the fall. The, the seed heads are so fluffy and pretty too. And then we have two goldenrods that we're offering. They're the ultimate keystone species. 85 species of butterflies and moths use them as a host plant. That's according to National Wildlife Federation's native plant finder. This is gray goldenrod. We find this in our prairies here. It's nice because it's a shorter goldenrod and it's definitely less aggressive than than some goldenrods that get a bad name for being so big and aggressive. Because it has such nice qualities in, in attracting these 85 species of butterflies and moths as a host plant, wow.
Now showy goldenrod, that's also native in our prairies here. In comparison with gray goldenrod, it's taller than gray goldenrod, but like it, it's less aggressive than some other goldenrods. It likes more moisture than gray goldenrod, but it can become aggressive in moist soils. Thus, it is best planted in poorer soils, such as rocky soil or clay. Unlike gray goldenrod, it prefers part shade, but is okay in full sun. Mine grows in full sun. And it definitely is showy. This is a bumblebee party. Prairie drop seed. I've seen it mentioned several times now that it can be planted as a living mulch. That means it takes up space between other plants without out competing the other plants. It's sort of like a, a ground cover. Aromatic aster. Very important to monarchs during fall migration. And in the garden will often form a kind of low mound. And silky aster. It's a short aster and in, in prairie seldom has more than a few flowers. And it's, it's among the first plants to come up in a, in a prairie where you have a prairie burn or something in the spring. And um, here come these leaves coming up and you can tell that they're silky aster leaves because they're, they feel silky. And um, they're like the first to come up and then they're about the last to bloom in the, at the end of the year. Prairie violet, this is our last one. It is a keystone plant, 26 species of butterflies and moths. It's the host plant for the regal fritillary. That's what I showed you, um, the photo from Lisa McNeil on the narrow leaf coneflower. That was a regal fritillary. There was an attempt to get it to be, um, become the state butterfly for Iowa. This is at Dorothy Pico Nature Center. Thank you to Dawn for providing these photos from there. And this is at Flathers Wetmore Prairie. It's 
in my remnant prairie and the other one is from Kansas. So thank you to the many people who provided photos and to Carrie, Marcy and Danielle for creating the handouts loaded with information, which is mainly derived from Prairie Moon. For this PowerPoint, I used additional resources from Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, and Iowa. Guidance varies due to differences in climate and soils, et cetera. So pay close attention to where you will plant your plants and do the best with the information we have. I hope that those who order plants this spring can get together on Zoom to have a discussion to help plan their gardens. And thanks to an anonymous donor, we can further reduce the price of plants purchased by pre-order by March 10th. We'll send an email in the next few days when the order forms and the website have been updated. Thank you. Note that Les Hills Wild Ones plans to offer plants again later in the season. Wildflowers, grasses, and sedges and the very important shrubs and trees. Also, most likely there will be special discounts for public gardens. So thank you very much. Thank you, Diane, so very much. I was absolutely mesmerized by the beautiful and peaceful walks through a myriad of very beautiful gardens. Um, we are open, I believe, for Q and A is, I don't know if we uh, wanna go ahead and open that up to both the chat and the Q and A, and I will, uh, let uh, leave and stop talking and let you ask any questions you might have or type those in the chat. I'll start with one question that was asked uh, directly. Uh, someone asked when these plants were started, and I believe that all the plants that we have on our order were started this season. Um, we're, they're all going to be first season plants, correct, Diane? Correct. Yeah. Diane? Yes? Is silky aster generally interchangeable with short aster? Is that what it's referred to? No, there's a short aster. That's okay. Different. All right. So this is this is another one that I'll have to buy then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you Thank like you. your asters. <laughs> there was a question about the discount. And if they've already placed an order, do they need to cancel and reorder? Yeah, I just I, I did just answer that in chat. No, no, because uh, the way we're doing orders, we're going to be invoicing people who order online. So we'll be able to, you know, even if they use the old order form, um, we'll be able to take care of that on our end. And I'm going to stop answering questions that are asked of other people. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're an excellent answer, and we really appreciate it. I know I personally will be revisit, revisiting and pausing this video more than once to work on my order. And my order has a lot of check marks on it for yes, must order. So, yeah, are there any other questions? Alum root, I have to ask. Is alum root related to the alum uh, food like, additive? Oh, that's not the question I thought you were going to ask. I thought you were going to ask if they were related to the to the cultivated coral bells. And yes, they they would be. Alum root. I I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Mm. 
it is it is one of my my favorite plants in my garden it's just it's it it's unique and has you know adorable tiny little flowers that are i find charming yeah i think they use alum and like pickles or something or i i mm -hmm. don't know yeah it's it's an it's it's an astringent um correct i'll pull that up all right thank you mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? I do not hear, please feel free to send those in or put those in the chat. And also if anyone, oh, go ahead, Janice, did you have a question? When will we need to have our orders ready by or is it gonna be another meeting to pull that together? Our initial deadline is March 10th because we have uh, limited quantities available to us. So our initial deadline is March 10th. Then we'll kind of revisit it at that time to see, you know, if if we're like running low on in inventory, if we're out of some plants, and we're going to kind of reassess from there. So try to get try to get the order in by March 10th to be to be perfectly safe. Will you be sending an order form or do we use this one that I printed off today? You can use the one that you printed off today. Uh, don't include a check. Um, we can we can send you an invoice or you can order online. Okay. Thanks. And I, I will try to get the new order form emailed to everybody who registered for this program um, and upload it to the website. But if you don't want to print it again, don't don't worry about it. Diane, I did have a question. I don't remember which species it was, but you said that it supports conservation biological measures. Right, that is something that um, the um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, they list that and they say that they get it from the Xerces Society, that information. And so I looked it up for a definition at the Lady Bird thing and I also went to Xerces and tried to get it get information and I, I do not have a definition for that but that's what they claim okay interesting <laughs> so I tried that's funny I saw that too and I wonder at the exact same thing <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> well we'll all have to get it and and plant it and figure it out ourselves right I'll ask a question about prairie violet. Um, my understanding is that it can cross cross breed hybridize with other, I don't want to say generic, but other other violets in our yard. The common. Is, common, common violet. violets. Is common. that is that a problem or do you think it's still beneficial to, to plant in our in our urban spaces? Sure, and it, it, it's um, it's vegetation is so pretty because it's got you know the leaf that is so distinct compared to the common violet, and even if they cross, there will be some maintenance of that. And mine out on my prairie that are native have not crossed with the ones in the woodland here, so hmm. I'm. They're staying pure, so I don't know. I, I wouldn't worry about it. Good. Any other questions out there? I know we had a few questions about the actual planting of the peat pots, um, whether to plant them within the pots, uh, let them root through the pots before we plant them, or um, the care of the actual peat pot itself. And I know you've done some research, Diane. Yeah, I did some research about it. And it seems like if, if they're grown and taken care of properly, they will probably be able to be planted just ex exactly as they are in the peat pot and that it can be dangerous to remove the bottom or to 
disturb them otherwise because the, the, that disturbs the roots. So that's the ideal thing about peat pots is that you're not disturbing the roots when you plant it. So, and we will assess the plants when we get them and see, you know, what we think. But John, John and in his experience, he was just able to plant the whole thing, just as was when he, when he plants them. This is Jeannie. I wanted to know then, take that a step further, would a person dig a little wider and, and a lot deeper, just loosen everything there before you put the, the uh, peat pod in? Or how do you prepare that hole beforehand? I mean, that sounds like a good idea to have it a little bit loosened up. You know, if you if you just dig down with a um, trowel or whatever, that can leave a thing that's just like a clay pot, so that the yeah. roots cannot expand. Right. And so, so it's nice to to put it in where it's invited to come in and to flourish. I would also add to that because I quit using peat pots. Um, but one of the things you have to be really careful of is that you get it completely covered or you tear off some of the top because right. otherwise it's going to dry out all the way down, even though the bottom part's covered. Right. It wicks out the moisture if any of the peat is showing at the top. Right. So either you rip off a little bit or you put dirt over that. Yeah. That's, so that, definitely. That's Thank you. Yes. For every everyone here who has downloaded the information we provide already, um, I'll amend that that section in the definitions and consideration um, to to be a little bit more complete regarding um, best practices with the peat pods. And that information will be updated at the same time as the other ordering information. Frankly, when I was reading it over and doing some research on it, I ended up ordering some for my vegetable plants because it some of them really do not transplant well. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to get over that. And they had a list of the plants. It was eggplant and some other squashes and stuff that are better planted in peat pots so that you yeah. can plant the whole thing and not disturb the, the roots. So I ordered some, I ordered 50, so that's gonna be different for me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it depends so much on the, on the species and the conditions you're planting in. Um, some species want to have their roots teased out um, and they can take a little bit of abuse. Some of them like it and others are just so sensitive that you really don't want to, to mess at all with, with, them, with their happiness. I have a little chart for that, which is Chris Helzer's try something, evaluate and adapt, try something else, evaluate and adapt. <laughs> I think that's going to be our peat pot experience as well. Um, I've had really good experience with them with vegetables. I've never done uh, the native prairie plants, but soaking them very thoroughly so that the peat pot almost is falling apart by the time you plant it. And then to Jeannie's point, I use often an auger on a drill to plant my plants. And so I just auger a little bit left, right, you know, at the base before I plunk that little plant in. Um, and that has been very effective. I've never had one die. So fingers crossed. Any other questions out there? I think they're eager to get to the game. 